Hello, I'm Arlen Nipper. I'm here to tell you about the Internet of Things. Um, I did a little research. I've always loved TED Talks. I did a little research. And I've seen that there's actually been quite a few TED Talks on the Internet of Things. So fortunately, this is the last one there'll be because in the next 17 minutes and 45 seconds, I'm going to tell you everything you ever needed to know about the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things, it's here. Or is it? If it is here, where is it? If it isn't here, when's it going to get here? The Internet of Things. What are the things that we're talking about? And more importantly, when the Internet of Things comes to fruition, is it going to really reduce complexity? Add value? Give us more time in our lives? Now, I can say over my 34 years in Embedded, I've seen some incredible projects. I truly believe the Internet of Things is going to bring all these things to our life. I've seen some incredible medical projects, transportation proje projects, security. Uh, across the industrial sector, the Internet of Things technology, the notion, is truly helping us. But we're talking about things here, and these things are embedded computers. Embedded computers have been around for 40 years now. They're, as we've seen, their, their capabilities are expanding at more law capabilities. But it's the human mindset of how we apply these to the problem, I believe, that's inhibiting the expansion of the Internet of Things. So when I go talk to customers about Internet Things, whether it's devices, whether it's, it's infrastructure services, or complete end-to-end -end Internet of Things service delivery, we always get into these what ifs, right? What if? So, very simple notion, the Internet of Things. Well, Arlen, but what if that's actually, what if it's M to M or it's another technology? And the Internet of Things is kind of like Jessica Rabbit in Roger Rabbit. It's like, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> well, the Internet, they couldn't have taken a worse acronym because it's really not using internet technology the way we know it, like HTTP and browsers, but that's what we're calling it. So that once we get the, the classification right, they go, well, geez, it's the internet of things, so we're going to have to get connectivity. So we have wireless or, or ethernet or wired connectivity or mesh networking. And then once we get that, we have to figure out, well, okay, which CPU, to, is it going to be Intel architecture or is it going to be ARM architecture? And then what operating system are we going to run? And once we get that, we're going to say, well, geez, what development tools are we going to write in C or Java or C++ or Objective-C? And then once we have the hardware and the operating system and the connectivity, what's going to be our dis discovery protocol and our data representation protocol and how are we going to manage billions of things in this new, you know, new um, world of the Internet? And then finally, it's like, well, geez, if we're going to have billions of devices, we're probably going to have to connect that to cloud computing. And then we're going to be creating all this data, and there's this new thing out there. It's called big data. And I, th I think that could be important, but to do that, I have to understand Cassandra. And to understand Cassandra, I can run Hadoop to run analytics. Well, wait a minute. Something that looked pretty simple is actually a lot of very complex layers of computer technology and communications and security and cloud computing and data representation and back-end implementations. So really, we've got to get to the point where for the Internet of Things to really take off, to scale to the 15 to 50 billion devices by 2020, something pretty radical has got to happen. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. And so for the last 15 years of my career, I've been trying to make embedded devices disappear. So what are we going to do? How are we going to approach this to where we can enable the Internet of Things to actually come to fruition and help us in our lives? So if I look back, you know, I've got some notions here. And the first thing I can say is that of my 30-year career, I can basically split it into two parts. The first 15 years was you know, embedded rules, IT rules. The second 15 years was, well, wait a minute, maybe IT had some notions that we should have been looking at when we were designing embedded systems for, for the last 15 years. 
So one of the real opportunities I had in my career was I got to work uh, with IBM Pervasive Computing Labs. I got to go to Hursley, England, and actually develop technology as IBM was trying to, to get into the uh, pervasive computing. And I had an opportunity uh, 12 years ago to fly to Zurich to be one of the keynote speakers at this conference that IBM was having, and they were announcing pervasive computing department. So I fly into Zurich, I get to the hotel like at 10.30, and I still remember her name. Bambi Grundig was the director of marketing for um, IBM, and she called and she said, Arlen, we've gone through your slide deck, everything looks really good, but we just need you to add one more slide to your deck. She goes, we're going to announce pervasive computing, but that means we've moved from somewhere. So we just need a real simple slide from you. What's the difference between embedded computers and pervasive computers? And could you have that done by tomorrow and have a good evening? <laughs> so I put this question up there. I usually give my audience you know, some time to think about this, but today you only have five seconds. What's the difference between an embedded, what, what, an embedded computer and pervasive computing. And then about an hour later, as I'm trying to explain this, uh, I'm starting to panic because I can't, haven't really come up with a good explanation of the difference between these two. Um, but the, the explanation that I came up with, actually I've lived with for the last 15 years because it was an epiphany to me. I was sitting there, I couldn't explain the difference between embedded, pervasive, M to M, Internet of Things, because in my mind, they were all the same. But it's not the same. And so really, I, what I came up with is that an embedded computer system is typically a microprocessor-based system that encapsulates process knowledge. Okay? This is an embedded computer. This is a pressure transmitter that goes into industrial process control plants. This, 30 years ago, this was an analog device. Today, it's a digital device. It's five times more accurate. It can tell you when it has a fault. Note, no keyboard or display, or reset button, by the way. OK. But the best example I give you is actual example is we had a customer that did mechanical peanut packaging machines. And they needed to improve the process. And so they were going to take their mechanical uh, packaging machine and put a computer on it and make it better. So they go, you know, they pick Joe in cubicle six. Joe, you know the process of our current peanut packaging machine, so you need a computer to automate it. And Joe did that. He sat down, he took embedded computer technology, and he made that machine. It was really cool. You had a big hopper, the peanuts came into it, the bags came across the conveyor belt, air would, would uh, blow into the bag, it popped open, they dumped a known amount of peanuts in, it would... Uh, stop the flow of peanuts, it would come across, a heat sealer would seal it, the bag would go off the machine. They increased the efficiency of that machine a hundredfold. Great stuff. Six months later, the sales department comes back to Joe in cubicle six. Joe, we could sell a thousand of those machines to a new customer, but this customer wants to take some of the metrics off of your new peanut packaging machine and take it into their ERP system. If we can't do that, we can't sell them. So Joe goes, oh man, I wrote all the software for this, so therefore I am the paradigm expert, so therefore I will create a new protocol. I'll write a peanut packaging protocol, or PPP. And then once I've done that, I'll go over here and I'll develop an application. And I'll, I'll hook the two together, and then I'll get the information, and then I'll send that to their ERP system. Boom. That's the problem that we've got today, is that any time you take an embedded system and you tie it to an application, you've basically made a one-to-one -one relationship of those two pieces of equipment, and you can't move. You can't change it. You can't be serendipitous with the data. You can't reuse it. And that's what we have today. It's not the Internet of Things. We have an Internet of RFID and an Internet of Telematics and an Internet of medical devices. So we have an Internet of these proprietary data silos. We don't have an Internet of Things yet. Now, conversely, Internet of Things, pervasive computing technology, uh, provides technology and the infrastructure to take this data from the machines that we're producing and make that available to the enterprise and beyond. 
I think I was watching Buzz Lightyear. At that. But what I tell people, actually, is I was, and beyond meant for my quote there, is I knew the, the, the Internet of Things was coming. Right. So IT integration and communications becomes a native part of the system. You don't isolate these devices that we're putting out there. So how are we going to do this? So what I did was I, I tried to come up with a recipe, a recipe for the success of the Internet of Things. And notice here, we need one part open source Internet of Things trans messaging transport. We need an HTTP. Uh, we need the same thing as HTTP is to the Internet of People. We need a protocol that we use for the Internet of Things to transport and send it back data back and forth. Second, three parts, you notice it's even big. Fold in IT and develop centric application tooling. The slide you saw, DARPA, um, 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 software organizations like Apache, getting Apache web server, Tomcat, the, the community at large for the development of the Internet of People had access to the technology so they could implement it. We don't really have the same open access and embedded. We have it, it's in pockets, but it's not generally available to the development community we see. And then take these ingredients, combine them, and mix them until the data separates from the application. Right? Don't try to tie the data up in these proprietary transport protocols or representations because, you know, again, it's the serendipitous nature of data. A lot of nodes on the Internet of Things are going to contribute to a larger knowledge base than any one separate item. I can't tell you how many times I've deployed systems that have been engineered with specifications this thick. The, the people behind me are seeing the system come up and they're seeing the pressures and the temperatures and the flow rates and the valves opening and closing and they go, oh cool. Man, I didn't know that. It, can I take that data and that data and this data and put it over here? Because if I could do that, I could optimize a completely different business process. But the problem is you can't do that today. We haven't constructed the right mentality and approach to doing that. Now, what's cool here is if you take those ingredients and you mix it long enough and you separate the application from the, from the data, then you can take and you can fold this onto hardware and bake it at 840 degrees until the solder melts. Because you know what we don't have a shortage of? We don't have a shortage of very capable, low power, highly integrated, uh, very memory dense CPUs. In fact, I would say that the semiconductor industry has exceeded the capabilities of the software and our technology to keep up with it. Serve warm on public private cloud deployment. Crucial. We can't deploy into servers and applications that people stand up. We can't do it fast enough. Uh, real quick, the numbers, if we're going to have 50 billion by 2020, that's going to be 127,000 servers a year or 340 servers a day that we would have to stand up if we were going to do this in segregated applications. So this is going to have to include cloud computing technology. But the most important thing is throw an Internet of Thing party and invite all the app developers because it's going to be the application developers that make this thing take off. It's going to be the guy that wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning and he has available software and he has available protocols and he can say, you know what? I just had a really good idea last night of how to take RFID and medical devices and integrate that into an entirely new application that none of us in this room knew about. But we've got to enable him to do that. Now, unlike a conventional theorist, I'm not going to just leave you with the recipe and say good luck, right? I'm going to kind of get into a DIY attitude here. So HTTP, HTTP drove the success of the Internet of People. And I think that MQTT, MQ Telemetry Transport, is, is one of the protocols that I developed with IBM. It's an open source protocol. It's freely available. There's implementations in like 14 different languages. But what we did when we designed MQTT is we optimized it for very low bandwidth, low power, 8-bit CPU devices. But we did it so that it was bandwidth efficient, data agnostic, and had continuous session awareness. Now, that's the other big thing. The, the Internet of Things now is, is, I wouldn't call it mission critical. 
If we're going to go to mission critical, we have to have stateful, secure connections. And how are we going to do that and what kind of a protocol representation? So, again, I'm not saying, you know, I helped design MQTT, and to me, you know, all problems look like nails, and I've got a hammer. But something, as a community, we get together as an ecosystem, and we say, this is the protocol, this is the data transport for the Internet of Things. If we don't do that, we're going to end up with an Internet of of siloed applications, and it will never come to the fruition the way the pundits say it will. And then the last part that we need is just like the Internet of People needed somebody like the Apache Software Foundation to help foster and put together the ecosystem and put together tools, and you knew you could download an Apache web server and write new cool applications and run on it. Well, the Eclipse Software Foundation, if you haven't heard of them, they're actually, they've been around, this is their 10th year anniversary, and what they do is they do open source tooling. The majority of the world's Java developers started using it, but now you can use it for all the programming languages. And I, along with the, uh, IBM and a couple other companies, put together an industry working group for the Internet of Things and Machine to Machine. And this is a group of like-minded companies engineers, open source contributors that are all getting together to help contribute to this ecosystem of building out the Internet of Things. Our goal is you can download the tools, you can get an open source DIY board like an Arduino board or a Beagle board or your own hardware and have something up and running on the Internet of Things in less than 10 minutes. That's our goal. So I put some links here to go to that, and I invite everybody. This is a call to action that you can go home. You can participate. You can talk to your colleagues about this. You can talk to industry about this and say, this is what we need to do to drive the success of the Internet of Things. There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>